I'm sorry we're running a little bit behind getting Jennifer on the show, but we have her up starting like right now. Jennifer, welcome to the show. How are you doing, girl? Hi, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Great Thank to you see for you. having me. Yeah, totally, man. It's so great to see you. Um, you know, there's so many people that I've met through the triple negative uh, breast cancer survivor group, and you're one of those. And uh, yeah. we put out the word out on that page that we were looking for folks to join today. And so we're very thankful that you were able to make it. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. And you're joining from Colorado. So you're our one mountain time zone person. We've had Eastern, yep. Central, and now we're on the mountain time zone. So is it cold there where you are today? No, it was beautiful. Awesome. It was like 50, maybe middle, awesome. mid 50s. Yeah. Awesome. I love Colorado. Love it. Love it. Love it. So I got to get up there again soon. Yeah. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, listen, um, the way I'd like to start the broadcast with you is uh, just to talk a little bit about how your breast cancer was found. Can you fill everybody in on that just a little bit? Yeah. Um, back in 2005, after my mother passed away from cancer, the end of 2005, we moved to Colorado here to be closer to my brother and my sister-in-law and we came out here and I started getting sick quite frequently and I was like oh well maybe it's the altitude maybe it's the dryness we moved from Indiana ground you know sea level pretty much lots of humidity um so I found a family physician out here and I was headed to her like every month and a half every two months and finally after about six months I said this isn't working or maybe it was a year I don't know but I was like, this isn't working. We got to do something. So she sent me to an ear, nose, throat doctor. They were trying to, they said that I had a collapsed sinus capillary. Well, that wasn't it. And so we lived here for about three and a half years and, and eventually moved to Florida closer to my husband's family. And after moving down there, I found a primary care physician and um, she was like, what brings you in? And I said, I just need to establish a patient basis with you because I've had issues with illness and they couldn't figure out what it was in Colorado. And so she says, oh, well, let's just do your yearly physical and do a mammogram. Um, do you have a history of breast cancer? And I said, no, the only cancer was my mother and my family. And so she says, well, we'll just go ahead and do your routine yearly physical and my first and only mammogram, they found it, the triple negative. Um, I was diagnosed on June 29th of 2010. Wow. And could you tell us again how old you were at that time? I was 36. Yeah, super young. And that's one of the things that we're pointing out to everybody on the broadcast is that triple negative breast cancer is more common in younger women and also even more common in African-American women. So 36 is quite young to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And you said it was your first and only mammogram you've ever had. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's crazy. So at that point, what happened next? Did you get in with an oncologist or, or what happened next? Um, I did, I did the biopsy, got the, the diagnosis and everything. And they wanted to try to send me to a, for, a plastic surgeon first thing. And I was like, no, that don't sound right. So um, by way of one of my former bosses at my former job, his wife was an RN for an oncology unit, and um, she got me in with some of the best doctors down in the Tampa Bay area. And I did, um, I did a double mastectomy, you no know, reconstruction, my choice. Um, my first round of treatment was uh, cytoxin and taxotere because um, I had signed up for a clinical trial study because, as you know, triple negative doesn't have or at that time didn't have any kind of pinpointed um, treatment options. So they were kind of just breaking up all the standard of care for the other, I guess, cancer or other breast cancers or whatever with the adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxotere. And I didn't do the red devil. I just did the cytoxin and the taxotere because that's what trial I was pulled for. Oh, gotcha. Okay. That's, that's good to know. And, and it's so cool because we're learning so many different things from all the different folks who've joined, because as we've said before, everybody's story is unique and different. And so you had this right. clinical trial and you were 36. And so how long um, was it, were you on that trial? Um, I think I did the standard four, or was it four or eight treatments? All I know is I did it from August of 2010 to December of 2010. I did 
like every two weeks treatments. And did you have the surgery first or was it after your treatment? Yes, I did the surgery first. And did they stage you at like stage one at the time? I was stage 2B. 2B. Okay. Courtney was stage Mm -hmm. 2B who was on earlier. So you had surgery Mm -hmm. first, opted to not have reconstruction. You know, we have a lot of ladies, like I've interviewed many women who've had breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer, and the large majority of them do choose reconstruction. And I'm curious if you could let everybody know your personal feeling for that decision. Um... Being diagnosed and I was like knowing that I was going to be going through chemo and that I had the surgery and I had just kind of went online looking, you know, found a breast cancer group, went in there. Um, And I just thought, you know, my body is going to be put through so much with chemo and the surgery and everything. Do I really want to just go through another surgery? And then finding out that the prosthetics needed to be replaced every so many years or whatever. I was just like, I I didn't want to put my body through all that. And I wanted to focus on healing. Yeah, Jennifer, you and I were very, very similar. And um, that's why it's so cool. There's a lot of flatty groups out there. I don't know if you're in the flatties unite group or not. But that's a really great group for for women who have had breast cancer that decided to go flat. But you know, it's, it's, it's good to always uh, find other people with who had similar experiences or, or thought processes. And I'm sure you say this all the time too, you know, we're right. not, we're not necessarily saying, Hey, no one should have reconstruction. We're just saying right. that, that was kind of what we went with and the reasoning behind it, which mine was the same thing. It was like, I didn't want to put my body through any, any extra, extra surgeries or anything else. It was kind of like, I just wanted to get through cancer right. you know and right. the treatment right. i wasn't really concerned with everything else so i'm gonna fixate on this for just a little bit because like i said we've only had i think maybe honestly one other guest who has gone flat other than me um on on the show so i want to talk a little bit um, more about that i know that um lisa was on earlier and i think she wanted to have reconstruction but ended up ended up not after a little while but has there ever right. been a point in time, Jennifer, where you were just like, oh, crap, what did I do? No, no, no regrets at all. None. Yeah. No. And I was curious. I actually wear um, prosthetics. Like I have a bra that has prosthetics inside, right. inside the bra, and I wear those. And the reason that I do that, one of the biggest reasons I do it is because for me, my chest is still very, very sensitive. Um, I have a little tiny, like kind of like a chihuahua. She's about 11 pounds. And she could just walk uh-huh. across, walk across my chest, and it and it hurts so bad for her to just walk across my chest. So it's uh, sort of right. like a protection for me. And um, and actually, my shirt up against my chest bothers me more oh, wow. than having the prosthetics because the 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 shirt is light and I can't feel it as well because I don't have as much feeling on the surface. But with the prosthetics, right. it's heavy. And so it feels more kind of like I did before. Um, do, how how is your chest like? How do you, how do you feel about your chest and how that feels? Um, I have not had any issues with mine. My surgeon was amazing. Um, he did a, an excellent job on mine. Um, I did wear prosthetics and a bra for probably four years, four or five years. And then I was chosen through P Inc, which is a national organization. And that's when I got my chest piece. And then I just went totally flat, no more prosthetics, no more bras. I was like, you know, and, 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 and it's more freeing, you know, I feel more free. And I know a lot of women, you know, they, they, if they don't choose reconstruction, they have the prosthetics to feel more normal, I guess. But I don't know. I, I I guess I'm not normal, <laughs> as they say. So <laughs> no, that's the thing is is everybody's unique, and even whether it's our stories or uh, us as people, everyone is unique, and that's what makes uh, it very interesting. And tell me a little bit more about this that you were chosen for. So it sounds like a, a tattoo company chose you for um, something. So P Ink, um, P Ink is a well, they're international, I believe now, but it's a it's a breast cancer organization where they um, donate free tattoos for to breast cancer survivors um, that chose to, that choose to go that route or want that form of healing. Um, I did mine back in twenty oh gosh twenty fourteen, <laughs> so my piece is almost it'll be seven years in October, but it's an amazing organization. 
And um, with COVID, I guess they're doing it kind of differently and just kind of working one-on-one -on -one with the tattoo artists and survivors. But when I went, we they have one day a year they call P Ink Day where they close down like tattoo artists donate their time and they'll close down their shop and take in like a group of survivors. So I did that here in Colorado up in Boulder back in 2014. That's uh, that's so cool. It just occurred to me because I, I was going to ask you how to spell P ink. And then I realized it's, it's <laughs> like, it's like trying to say uh, pink, but yeah. ink, ink like tattoo. So is it, is it right. capital P space ink I N K? Um, I think it's p dot then the word ink dot org or something is their website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I've yeah. got a couple yeah. of our uh, moderators are asking. I think they're gonna probably post about it when they find the right page. So p ink um, right. is what to look at. That's so cool. I've never heard of that. So when you decided about now, I'm just like you know rabbit trail. This is it's very <laughs> interesting and it's such a different yeah. topic uh, from what we right. normally talk about. I really love it. I, I'm so glad that. Each one of you before when we met last night, I was like, hey, is there anything you don't want to talk about? I have written here in my notes, Jennifer, you said open book. So it's it's free for mm -hmm. me to ask anything. So about your right. tattoo, um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose this this specific piece? I see there's like a crown in there, I think. Um, yeah, it's a it's actually a Cladoff symbol, which stands for love, loyalty and friendship. And I, I'm, my family's Irish, has a lot of Irish, I have a, a lot of Irish blood, and I, um, I truly love the meaning behind the clad all. So, yeah, that's why I chose it. That's so awesome. And so each piece that P Ink does is a large piece that covers uh, where you used to have breasts. Um, not all. Um, some, some of the women that come and get done, they are actually reconstructed and they just gotcha. want the art over their scars because they don't want to be reminded of that. Um, each piece is different. Some are small, some are large, you know, it's just, I guess the, the choice of the survivor and what, what, it, what they want it to mean to them. That's so, so cool. Thanks for explaining a little bit more about that organization and sharing that with everyone watching oh, of today course. because I think that's important to know, not only just if you're a, a breast cancer survivor, triple negative breast cancer survivor, reconstruction, no reconstruction, it's helpful to all those people. And then also right. to those viewers who aren't affected directly by it at all to just learn about all the different types of things that, that come into play when we're going through breast cancer and, and all those different kinds of options for things like what you've done, which is very, very cool. So you had your surgery, you had your double mastectomy, you decided to go flat, and then you had your chemo through a clinical trial. And mm -hmm. so how, how, how did that go for you? Did you have any issues or any side effects from that? Um, no, well, side effects, just the basic, I lost my hair, nausea. Um, the worst of that was the new last, the shot the day after to boost the white counts that you had. To, the bone pain from that was just so excruciating that I wouldn't wish it on anyone. No, girl, I'm totally there with you. I remember the first time it hit me, it felt like somebody had gone at me with a with a bat and I was just curled up in a ball on the couch. So, yeah, that was yep, the worst. Yep. But you did yep. lose your hair, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And um, did you have any other physical issues, like as far as like your nails having trouble or uh, nope. skin or anything like that? Nope, nope, no, nope. no skin issues, no nails, no nothing. Right, and just I was going to ask you when you lost your hair, was that an emotional thing for you? Um. No, I had, I had went and got my hair cut short and like, they told me like, expect it to, you know, fall out. It was at first I was like, oh, because of when it started falling out in clumps, I was like, oh, but then my, my husband shaved my head for me. And then when I got re-diagnosed with metastasis, I, before that it could even happen, I just shaved my head. I didn't, I didn't want to go through that again. Yeah, no doubt. So w tell us where you are now with your journey through breast cancer. Um, right now I'm, I'm doing well. I, um, I go once a year for brain MRIs. I will be going the end of July this year for 
what is hopefully my last brain MRI and I will see my oncologist in August. And if all that is good, um, I will be six years out from any of any former treatment. So at that point, she's considering releasing me from her care and calling me cured. <laughs> wow. So you, you said something about metastasizing um, in there. Um, so you, it was, you were 30, 36, I think you said when you were diagnosed mm -hmm. and, um, and then right. you had your, you had your surgeries, you had that treatment and then you had something else happen. Cause you said, I think that it was in 2010 when your whole journey began, right? Yes. So what did something else happen between, um, that point when you finished treatment and now where you, where you um, had something else happen? Yeah. So almost a year to the date of me finishing treatment for my original diagnosis in December, I finished in December, 2010, December 1st of 2011, I was diagnosed with brain or I'm sorry, with lung mets. It had went to both lungs kind of salt and peppered everywhere. Um, the only thing I did for that was chemo. I did the carboplatin gems are routine. And when I was in the middle of that treatment, we moved back here to Colorado. So, and I was on that treatment from December of 2011 until April of 2013. And then my oncologist here in Colorado took me off from that treatment in April of 2013 to give me a break, but I was doing so well that she never put me back on it. And in March of 2014, I ended up getting diagnosed with brain meds. Wow. And, but we jumped ahead a second ago. So now going back and I'm like, how the heck did you get to where you're doing so well right now? So, so you were diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer in 2010. Um, yes. You had your surgery, you had your treatment. I'm sorry. I'm one of those chronological order people. So I'm just trying to keep track. <laughs> and then, and then you, uh, about a year later or so you got diagnosed with, uh, it had metastasized into your lungs. Um, yeah. what was the experience? Like what symptoms did you have when it came back into your lungs? Did you have any system symptoms or was it just found in a regular like scan? No, I, um, the only symptom I had, <laughs> which is ironic because I, after I finished the chemo for my original diagnosis, I started training for the Susan G. Komen three day, 60 mile walk <laughs> down in Tampa. And, um, about, I would say August of that summer, we were in the middle of one of our training walks and I started having, um, pain, like in my shoulder blade, my middle back. And it, um, it was just nagging, but then it kind of got worse. And so I went to the doctor, I guess it was the end of September, beginning of October of 2011, and they did um, x-rays and they found a spot. And so they sent me off for a CT. They did that. Yeah, spot's still there. And then, so they sent me for a um, lung biopsy. And it came back that it was still triple negative that had metastasized. And at that point is I started chemo three days before Christmas on, in 2011. Wow. Dang girl. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so then, so then they, they get, they wrangle down your, your lung, your lung metastasis, the metastasis, metastatic eyes, everything into your lungs. Yeah. They, they get a hold, they get a hold of that. And then you get, yeah. And then it get it in your brain. What were yeah. the symptoms that you had when it when it went to your brain? Um, symptoms when it went to my brain. I was actually on a gifted vacation through another breast cancer nonprofit, and we were out in San Francisco. And the day that we had booked to go to Alcatraz, I woke up that morning with like a super bad headache, and I was like, I, I just can't kick it. And so I got aspirin on the way to the ferry to go to Alcatraz and the headache went away. Everything was fine. And then after that, I was getting headaches off and on and, um, I don't fly well, <laughs> not at all. So I thought maybe well, it was I, like always, a, I always say, I don't like to fly. My arms get tired, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Well, I thought, I thought from like all the pressure changes and like whatever, and like I hadn't flown in forever. So I just like kind of discarded it. That was January of 2014. And that went on from January until March, March often on headaches. But I would say like the middle of February ish, I started getting like when I would stand up, 
like a couple of seconds later, I get like super dizzy that I just have to stand there and like stop myself. Like my blood sugar, my, like my blood sugar was dropping or something. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know. And um, we had taken our elderly neighbor's car to a garage to get it checked over because she was going to be selling it. And I fell out in the parking lot of that garage oh, no. and my husband rushed me to the emergency room. And that's where they found a um, five centimeter tumor in my brain that had outgrew its blood source. Oh my god. And that's what had that's what had caused me to black out. And my my brain, my first brain surgeon said that had my husband not got me to the hospital that day, I probably would not have made it. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So what what did they do at the hospital? Like what was their steps? Um they did a CT and that's when they found the the tumor. Um they put me on IV steroids like automatically and um they were gonna do the surgery like the next day and the doctor's like, well, you might lose like half of your vision. And I was like, oh, well, is it critical that I have the surgery done? Like now then I'm like, is there any way I can go home? Like (laughs) for a couple days to see my dogs and get my things in order and whatnot, you know? And he said, yeah. So I did that. And I ended up going back like that following Saturday morning and getting the tumor removed, but the tumor was wrapped around my optic nerve. So they couldn't get it all. This so is so the- terrifying, girl. I love the thing that I love about talking to you is you're just like, yeah, so what happened was I had, and you're just like so chill about it. And it's like, it's, it's, I'm, I'm grateful that it's not, you know, tearing you right. apart emotionally and that you're at a point where you're like, okay, here's what happened. You know what I mean? It's right. it's so cool that you've, that you've just, just powered through to where you are today. But okay. So they're at this point and they're like, we can't, we're having trouble with the tumor because it's wrapped around your optic nerve. That's where I cut you off. Take it from there. Right. So that's when he said that I may lose um, 50% of my vision because if he nicked the optic nerve or something, there was a chance that, yeah. But um, so he did an excellent job, but he wasn't able to get the part that was wrapped around the optic nerve. And um, I didn't lose any of my vision when I was coming in out of anesthesia and my surgeon came in and he did like the finger tests and like waving his hand in front of my face and all that. And um, he's like, gosh, he's like, I think you see better now than you did before the surgery. <laughs> so um, I ended up in the hospital. I think I only spent a day and a half after that surgery. And I did three um, cyber knife treatments after that to kind of pinpoint on my optic nerve where he couldn't get. Yeah, I, I've heard of gamma knife before. Is cyber knife different from gamma knife? Mm, you I'm, know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not completely sure. the The cyber knife is the pinpointed one where, like, they pinpoint the to like a spe- specific spot. So I did that. I did three treatments of the cyber knife, and I was going every eight weeks after that for brain MRIs. And in February of 2015, it was showing that there was a possible tumor growing back in that tumor bed. And um, I went in April of 24, no, I'm sorry, April of 2015. And they said that that spot had grown worse. So at that point, my brain surgeon says, you know, we don't know if it's cancer and the way that it was growing, it was growing towards a ventricle in my brain. And he said that if it is cancer and it's that ventricle, like I'm done for. So I went in May of 2015 and did a second craniotomy brain surgery and um, come to find out what was in the bed was all necrosis. It was the tumor that had wrapped around my optic nerve. The radiation had killed it off and it had fell into that bed. This is so fascinating. The story is just incredibly fascinating. Where are all these scars? Um, um, they, shaved, on- they shaved your head probably. If you, if you had hair at that point, they shaved your head to, yeah. to cut in and they're on the backside of your head? Yeah, yeah. I have. Well, it's an upside down J. So like my husband says, they just put your first initial in the back of your head. So you don't forget your name. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, that's all good to know. So right? when you were like going through this, because I know like now, like I said earlier, like now you're talking about this and it's just very matter of fact about it. But at the time, were you just scared like senseless? I, I just can't imagine Somebody telling me, you know, first of all, you had uh, it metastasized to your lungs, then it metastasized to your brain, and now here I go to brain surgery. 
Um, do you even have time to think about all that? Or are you just like really focused on what you got to do? No, I'm, I'm really focused on what I have to do and doing everything I can to be right for my body. Um, one thing I did do, I read a book that was recommended to me by another, a former breast cancer survivor, um, who has since passed, but, um, she recommended this book, mind over medicine. And it really helped me with like my mind and my, my thoughts and like not focusing on the disease and focusing more on my whole self that's, and my health. And it's called mind over medicine. You said, yeah. Yes. I have a feeling that's a book that I would really like a lot because, um, like I, I always, uh, tell people they should read a book called, uh, what to say when you talk, when you're talking to yourself. And it's basically just the, the way of, of making sure that all the thoughts that you're having are positive thoughts, you know? Right. And right. that you're focusing on that and that you're letting all the negative thoughts go away and, and not focusing in on that. So I, about the, the cyber knife that you were talking about, is that any kind of a laser or is that like a radiation therapy? It's a, it's a, it's a laser radiation therapy. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's both. Okay. See, look at what I'm learning. Is this crazy? Mm -hmm. All right. So all that stuff got done and you, you get all the treatment, all the surgeries out of the way Mm -hmm. for any uh, of the metastatic cancer that you had, as far as your lungs and your, and your brain. And then Mm -hmm. there, they continue doing scans throughout the years, I would assume at certain frequencies. How frequently were you having scans at this point? Um, from my, for the neck down, I was doing them yearly. Um, I've been doing them yearly, the brain. Um, I just started yearly after this. Well, no, I'm sorry. Take that back. 2017 in 2017 is when she started the yearly MRIs. And you've been clear since 2017. I've been clear since actually, well, 2015. Wow. It's, are they just like looking at you like you're some kind of a walking miracle or, are, I mean, I don't mean to like yeah. say anything bad, but are they, or are they just like, oh, well, it's going to appear, please don't take this wrong, but are they just like, it's going to appear at some point, but right now it's not, or what are their thoughts on that? Um, no, my oncologist, she's, she's really cool. Um, <laughs> the, the second visit I had with her after she got my medical records, cause I transferred to her five years ago, I fired my team down here that did both of my brain surgeries and everything. Um, and that's a whole nother thing. It's because they wouldn't refer me to a specific treatment that I ended up getting after my second brain surgery. But my oncologist, when I've seen her on my second visit, she says, I'm going to be straight up for with you. Um, she says, after reading through your records and seeing your medical history, she's like, I thought you were a train wreck and, pro- you know, you were a train wreck. She's like, I didn't expect you to come in here walking, talking and like being just the way you are. <laughs> she's like, I expected somebody to be carting you in here in a wheelchair and you to be like pretty much nonverbal. And I was like, oh, I'm <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. That's so crazy. So now you're having an annual uh, MR or uh, annual brain scan. And then you were <laughs> already doing an annual scan for everything else, like neck down and everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. And is there anything like right now, any, any problems that you're experiencing as a result from all your treatment or is there any, no. Um, Yeah, that's so crazy, man. I'm just like, are you like Miracle Girl? Is that, you know? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, and when I switched to this oncologist that I have in Denver now, I was in the middle of doing um, 40 hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatment. Okay. Um, That's something, and that's why I fired my oncology team that I had in the city here where we live, because they wouldn't refer me to get this treatment, and it it's necrosis is one of the only um, conditions that insurance will approve for the specific treatment. So I had to go through my primary family care doctor and he was able to get me those treatments. And so I was in the middle of those when I switched oncologists and my oncologist says, you know what? She's like, you know, this isn't something that we normally do, but she's like, I'm going to don't quit the treatments, continue on the treatments. I'm going to follow your progress. And we'll see where you go from there. And for probably the last two years that I've seen her, she said that she believes that those helped me tremendously. So 
Wow, it's just such a, you know, it's like when Dr. O was talking earlier and they were talking about all the different uh, types of treatments and things and, and just mm -hmm. like, it's just like you take this from over here, this from over here, this from over here, and you build this little whatever for uh, the specific issues that that person is having or the specific conditions and you just right. find the exact thing that works for that person. And Jennifer, I just have to say, you're you're definitely an inspiration to many women out there. And I know probably um, Amy, who was just on right before you, I, I mm -hmm. think that, that she uh, probably more than anyone is, is uh, really appreciative that you're sharing your story because she's kind of in the thick of all that right now with metastatic triple negative breast cancer mm -hmm. and, and trying to get to the point where she's got, you know, no evidence of disease. That's the thing that all, right. all breast cancer survivors want to hear is NED, yeah. no evidence of disease. And at this point, since 2015, from what you're saying, you've had no evidence of disease since then, right? Yes, that's correct. Wow. I like almost wanted to cry when you said that just now. That's amazing. <laughs> that's very, Thank very you. cool. Um, I did Thank have you. a question here from someone. They were wondering <laughs> if uh, when you moved from Florida to Colorado, did you have any issues with the continuation of care when you changed uh, oncologists? Or was everything okay? Um, no, when I, I knew I was leaving Florida. So when I knew I was leaving Florida, that was the first thing I did was get on, find an oncologist for the city that we were moving. And when I called to set up an appointment with the new oncologist, um, the secretary that had answered, I asked her, uh, she, she says, well, I, I told her, you know, I'm going to be a new patient. I'm moving from across the country. You know, I've did my research. I said, I want, you know, one of these two doctors. And she said, well, you know, they're both accepting new patients and whatever. So I just simply said to her, like, if you were in my shoes, which doctor would you choose? And she told me, and that's what I want with. And I really loved that doctor <laughs> until she you know, wouldn't give me that referral and wasn't working for me, her patient. I was, but, um, yeah, no, I was, I was in a good spot when I came here. Wow. Very cool. That's, that's very lucky. And again, I just want to say, Jennifer, that you are so inspiring and even, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to you and it's inspiring to hear the power of positive thinking and just how well that served you and, um, you know, just made such an impact in your life and, to be um, metastatic and then have no evidence of disease for, you know, almost six years now is just miraculous. And I hope that we can have you back on the show again in the future to get an update on you and see how you're doing. If not, I hope that you will personally keep me updated now that we're, yes. you know, connected on Facebook and everything. That would be fantastic. And if you haven't already, definitely, girl, you got to join our Survivors Rock, a breast cancer can stick it community, our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and keep us posted on how you're doing there because I, I would love to continue to hear about your story as you move forward. Of course. Of course. I would love to. That's any so help fun. that I can, any survivor. I, I love helping. So yeah, any, any way, any, you know, if anybody's out there and they want to reach out to me, please feel free. That's so awesome. I just want to say that Gayla just messaged and she says, you're absolutely amazing. I love your attitude. Thank you for your inspiration. A true warrior. You go girl. Thank so you so much. And there's a lot of people here that are really giving you props, girl. Uh, Nancy says, you are my hero, Jen. Courtney says, wow, you are really lucky, Jennifer. You are a rock star. I hope your next MRI is clear. You are an inspiration, especially for staying positive to keep, and to keep going. Um, Gail also says, I love you, Jenno. I think that maybe oh, is a friend of yours. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my best friends growing up. <laughs> yeah, and Courtney is in the house. Courtney Woods, she's part of our uh, Survivor's Rock, a breast cancer can stick community, and she wanted to point out that she went flat as well. So Courtney, uh, I've had her on the show before, and she is also one of us uh, flat folks too. So, man, girl, again, it's so great to speak with you and to have you on. And uh, guess what? I just got excited. I hit the microphone into myself because I got excited oh, no. because our, <laughs> our social media team just now posted and said 50 shares. So we just raised $500 awesome. by getting 50 shares. So woohoo, everybody, woohoo, woo raise the roof. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Like we're right here down to the wire. We're just about to sign off with you at this moment and we get the 50 shares to raise $500 to an anonymous donor. That is so cool. Thank you guys all who are watching, who shared this out. I appreciate it so much. And Jennifer, again, thank you for hanging out with thank us you. tonight and sharing your story. It's such a blessing to meet you. And we hope to get an update from you real soon, okay? 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, girl. Have a good one. Uh-huh. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guys. That is Jennifer. She rocks, man. She's amazing. And man, what a show, guys.